This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. There are a few housekeeping items before we start the show. The True Crime Podcast Festival is on Saturday, July 13th at the Marriott in downtown Chicago, right on the Magnificent Mile. There will be over 80 true crime podcasters there. I'm excited that Jillian from Court Junkie, Erica Kelly from Southern Fried True Crime, and Sheila Waisaki from Without Warning will be there. This event will go the full day, and there will be a meet and greet, panel discussions, and live episodes. I'm looking forward to the live crossover episode between Robin Wardner from The Trail Went Cold and Christy Lee from Canadian True Crime. To find out more and join the almost 400 people who have bought tickets, head to truecrimepodcastfestival.com or look for it on social media. I can't wait to see you there. Also, the ratings and reviews for the podcast have been rolling in, and I want to thank everyone who left a review. Your feedback helps me improve the show, and I read reviews from every single country, so thank you. Now, let's get on to the show. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. I'm sure this case has been featured on other podcasts, but I wanted to cover it because it's interesting how crime changes with technology. Things like Grindr, Tinder, and social media allow people to have quick access to strangers, and people are able to portray themselves in any way they want. The perpetrator in this case took full advantage of hiding behind technology. He created fake profiles and different personas to lure them into his apartment so he could drug and rape them. I have a lot of empathy for the victims. A long time ago, my friends and I were regulars at a local bar. Every time we went there, I had a bartender who gave me an excessive amount of attention I wasn't interested in. His persistence was uncomfortable to the point where everyone took notice. One night, we suspect that this bartender drugged my drink, and I blacked out. Lucky for me, my night ended when I safely arrived at my apartment in one piece. For the next 48 hours, I went through one of the worst sicknesses of my life. And if it weren't for the people in my life watching out for me, that night could have ended differently. Later on, we heard that this bartender was fired for doing similar things to other female patrons, which confirmed what happened to me. I hope these women also had good people in their lives. You're listening to Episode 9, Stephen Port, The Grinder Killer. The queer club scene in London has been an ever-changing landscape since the 1970s. Many iconic venues have closed their doors over the years, but new ones have re-emerged in their place. In 2015, Vice released a documentary called Chemsex, which brought attention to the relationship between gay culture and drugs. As a result, there has been a queer club sober movement, but the reality is that the chemsex scene is still booming. Chemsex, what is it? Gay or queer men will sometimes have sex after taking recreational drugs to enhance or prolong their sexual experience. The sex might last hours or days. There might be multiple partners. Some drugs of choice are methamphetamine, known on the street as crystal meth, crystal, ice, tina, or tea. Mephedrone is sometimes called meow meow. Alkyl nitrites, often referred to as poppers, and sometimes Viagra and cocaine. The mainstream media refers to GHB as the date rape drug, but in the chemsex community, GHB or gamma hydroxybutyrate is the favorite drug of choice. GHB is better known as liquid X, liquid ecstasy, or cherry meth. It heightens confidence, lowers inhibitions, and inhibits ejaculation, which allows the sexual experience to last a long time. GHB is a powder, but they call it GBL when dissolved in water. Small doses of GHB are euphoric, and larger doses cause sweating, loss of consciousness, nausea, hallucinations, amnesia, confusion, or coma. 
Accidental overdose is a serious risk because the potency of the substance can be very unclear when in liquid or powder form. HIV, hepatitis, and sexually transmitted infections are another risk from sharing needles and not following safer sex practices because of lowered inhibitions. Statistics tracking deaths for GHB are inadequate because no one routinely tests for it. Chemsex parties started over 20 years ago, but dating apps and social media have allowed these parties to become more accessible and popular. Grinder plays a prominent role in helping men find other men to date or hook up with. It wouldn't be uncommon to receive a message asking if you P&P or party and play, which is another term for chemsex. Dealers sometimes sell GHB on these apps and will facilitate or host chemsex parties. The number of allegations of rapes linked to dating websites has risen sixfold in the last five years, according to the National Crime Agency, which is a national law enforcement agency in UK. There are a litany of reasons why the chemsex community use drugs. It might start out as an experiment or curiosity. Drugs are fun and pleasurable. It's a way of connecting with the community. Some use drugs to medicate the complex issues around being gay and society's acceptance. Others are used due to fear of intimacy or internalized homophobia. There are inherent risks that men take by participating in this community. However, one risk they do not expect is being murdered. Anthony Walgate was a 23-year-old college student. He was in his second year of fashion design and art school at Middlesex University. One of Anthony's friends said he was not always the best at managing money. So, in 2012, he did escort work to earn extra cash to pay for college. Anthony was choosy about his clients and often aggressively managed the risks, even turning down clients if he had reservations about their arrangement. As part of his safety precautions, He told his friends about each job. Anthony would send them the picture and the name of who he was meeting. On June 15, 2014, Jodine contacted Anthony through the male escort website, sleepyboy.com. Sleepy Boys touted that the best gay escorts were listed there, and they were the place to search for gay, bisexual, and transgender escorts. Jodine offered Anthony 800 pounds for him to stay overnight on June 17th. Before Anthony left, he told his friend about the arrangement with the time, date, location, and the name of the client. On June 19th, emergency services received a call. That's the ambulance for the address of the emergency. Cook Street, there's a young boy. Looks like he's captured outside. I don't know. Outside of which number? Uh, 4758. Sorry? 4758, I think. 47. Cook Street. Yeah. What, what area? Parking. Okay. Looks like you've collapsed or had a seizure or something. Just always just drunk. Like, yeah. okay. What's the kind of thing you're calling from? Uh, I'm just holding up my car. I've got to get my car on the parking. Oh. Right, don't worry about that. What's the kind of thing you're calling from? Hello? If he didn't catch all of that, a man called in and said that he saw a boy who collapsed on Cook Street. When he was questioned about where he was calling from, the man hung up on the operator. So the operator traced his phone number and called him back. The man was apprehensive about giving an exact address. Hello, the ambulance is Well, the cover is there. Just confirm the location. Oh, I'm just doing it right now. Um, where was it that they were outside of? Uh, Cook Street. What's your number? I don't know, I just, I didn't look, uh... You said the number seven before. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, what's for seven times. Yeah. Do you uh, think that they had a seizure, is that correct? It's, uh, um, man of law, Yeah. So, were you passing by in your car? Yes. Okay, and you've drove past now, so you're no longer there. That's right. How old did he look, roughly, sir? 20. Do you know who was awake? 
No. Do you know if she was breathing? No, I don't know. Did you see anything happen at all? No. No. You just think they possibly had a piece of room lying there on the floor? Yes. When police went to Cook Street, embarking East London, they found Anthony Walgate in a sitting position, leaning up against the wall. His shirt was pulled up and bunched on his chest. The zipper of his pants was open. His underwear was removed and had been replaced inside out. There was a bottle of GHB in his pocket, and Anthony was dead. Police discovered that a man named Stephen Port had placed the 999 call. When they questioned him, he denied that he knew Anthony. However, after police pressed him, Port eventually admitted that he hired Walgate. Stephen said that Anthony willingly took his own drugs at his flat and became sick. They had sex two times, and Anthony was tired, so he stayed over. The next day, Stephen went to work and left Anthony to sleep. Port returned later that night and panicked when Anthony was making gurgling noises and was stiff. Stephen didn't know what to do, so he dragged the young man outside. Then he got in his car, and he called the ambulance. Port asked the detectives, if this whole situation was an accident, and if Anthony had a fit at my place, would I still be at fault? On June 26, they arrested and charged Stephen Port for perverting the course of justice, since he lied about knowing Anthony. Stephen bailed out, but not before they took a DNA sample for the database. Police did not know what happened to Anthony's cell phone. His blood and urine samples showed fatal levels of GHB. Even though the police took Stephen Port's computer, they never looked at it. Had they examined it, they would have found what he typed in the Google search box immediately before checking out Walgate's escort profile on sleepyboy.com. The next day, Port used a fake name and contacted Walgate to set up a date. Anthony's friends pressed the police and asked if they had searched Port's laptop or phone. The police told them that it was too expensive to do so. At a certain point, the police contact wasn't there when Anthony's friends or family called, and then wouldn't return their phone calls. After they finished the investigation, police ruled Anthony Walgate's death an overdose, even though there were 14 bruises all over his body. On August 28, 2014, Barbara Denham and her dog, Max the Border Collie, were taking their daily walk through St. Margaret's Churchyard. She preferred walking him there because she could unleash him and not worry about dealing with traffic or people. She noticed a man who was sitting down with his back, resting against the wall. He had on sunglasses, and his suitcase was next to him. Even though Barbara had seen homeless people sleeping in this area before, she sensed that something was wrong. She tried to verbally wake the man, But when she reached out to touch his cheek, it was cold. She realized that he was dead. Barbara pulled out her phone and dialed emergency services. Police found a bottle of GHB in the man's pocket, and his cell phone was missing. A few days later, it was reported that the man's name was Gabriel Kavari, or he sometimes went by the name of Gabriel Klein. He was 22 years old, and they ruled his death an overdose. He was from Slovakia, but lived in South London. He felt his home country was too intolerant, so he moved to London, but he didn't have a stable place to live until he met John Pape via the internet, who let him stay in a spare room. Gabriel stayed with John for about six weeks, until he found a place to rent on Cook Street. Gabriel moved to his new apartment on August 23rd. He never told John Pape where he moved to. Shortly after, Gabriel had texted a friend, and said that he slept on the sofa and didn't want to sleep in his new flatmate, Stephen Port's bed. The next day, Stephen texted his friend and neighbor, Ryan Edwards, and said that he should meet his new Slovakian twink flatmate. Ryan briefly met Gabriel that night and later texted Stephen to say that his roommate was nice. Port texted Ryan back and said that he was taking good care of his new flatmate, he he. Gabriel messaged Ryan and said that Stephen is not a nice person. He is not the man we think he is. This concerned Ryan, so he messaged Port again and asked how Gabriel was doing. Port sent a suspicious text back to Ryan and said that Gabriel left 
but he did not know where he went. Then, Port changed his story and said Gabriel had left to stay with another local guy, some soldier he had met online. Port changed the story for a third time, and he said that Gabriel went home to Slovakia, but had contracted a sudden illness and died. Ryan didn't realize it, but the text messages on his phone were vital evidence that linked Stephen Port to Gabriel Kovari. Gabriel's ex-roommate, John Pape, had previously helped Gabrielle set up a bank account, so John's flat was the last known address on record. After Gabrielle had turned up dead, 500 meters from Stephen Port's flat, police showed up at John Pape's door to inform him that Gabrielle was dead. The news upset and surprised John. He turned to the internet and searched for unexplained deaths in Barking and saw that the locations of Anthony Walgate and Gabrielle Covari's deaths were close in proximity when he put the information into Google Maps. At this point, the police had said there was no relationship between the two deaths. John Pape felt that he had important information about the last days leading up to Gabrielle's death. He offered himself up for an interview, but detectives did not call him back. Gabrielle had an ex-boyfriend, Terry Amadio. Terry noticed that a stranger named John Luck had followed Gabriel on Facebook. He reached out to John Luck to see if he had any information about Gabrielle's passing. John Luck was an American who came to London to attend college. He was surprised to learn that Gabrielle had died and told Thierry that he and Gabrielle had spent two nights together around the 22nd of August. But then an older man had picked Gabrielle up after that. The party they attended was one of those types where young guys get high from GHB and get raped. Thierry urged John Locke to call detectives to tell them everything he knows. John never followed up with authorities, so Thierry contacted detectives himself and gave them a link to John Locke's Facebook profile. Detectives never attempted to track John Locke down. If they had, law enforcement would have realized that this was a fake profile created by Stephen Port to keep tabs on the investigation. A few weeks after Gabriel's death, on September 20th, Barbara and Max were walking their usual route through St. Margaret's Churchyard. She found another man in a seated position, the same configuration as when she previously discovered Gabriel Cavari. Barbara thought to herself, please not again. She reached out and touched the boy's ankle. His skin was cold. She pulled out her cell phone and dialed the police. The man was 21-year-old Daniel Whitworth. He was a hardworking and ambitious chef. He lived with Ricky, his boyfriend of three years. They found a suicide note in Daniel's pocket. The note read, I'm sorry to everyone, mainly my family, but I can't go on anymore. I took the life of my friend, Gabrielle Klein. We were just having some fun at a mate's place, and I got carried away and gave him another shot of G. I didn't notice while we were having sex that he had stopped breathing. I tried everything to get him to breathe again, but it was too late. It was an accident, but I blame myself for what happened, and I didn't tell my family I went out. I know I would go to prison if I go to the police, and I can't do that to my family, and at least this way I can at least be with Gabrielle again. I hope he will forgive me. By the way, please do not blame the guy I was with last night. We only had sex, then I left. He knows nothing of what I have done. I have taken what G I have left, with sleeping pills, so if it does kill me, it's what I deserve. Feeling dizzy now, as took ten minutes ago. So hoping you understand my writing. I dropped my phone on the way here, so it would be in the grass somewhere. Sorry to everyone. Love always. Daniel P.W. Daniel Whitworth was not known to be suicidal, but he had a fatal amount of GHB and sleeping pills in his system. At first glance, his parents looked at the suicide note and didn't know if it was their son's handwriting or not. The police took this as an affirmation that the note had been penned by Daniel. They did not bother bringing in a handwriting expert to analyze the note. Pathology noted that there was bruising around Daniel's armpits, which might have come from being handled manually prior to death. The portion of the suicide note 
that mention the guy I was with last night was not investigated by police. If the authorities would have explored this, they would have concluded that the guy he was with last night was Stephen Port. They found Daniel sitting on a blue bed sheet. If police would have tested DNA from Whitworth's sheet, body, or clothes, it would have been a match for Stephen Port, whose DNA was already in the database. Daniel Whitworth and Stephen Port met on FitLads and met up on September 18th. The day after they met, Stephen Port immediately deleted his FitLads account. After hearing about the death of Daniel Whitworth, John Pape was now worried that there was a serial killer on the loose and his community was being targeted. He conveyed his concern to the police, but they told him that all three murders had no connection. A few months later, in January 2015, Stephen Port was convicted and sentenced for perverting the course of justice when he lied to police about knowing Anthony Walgate. They gave him an eight-month jail sentence. Stephen only served three months and was released with an electronic tag, which he wore until June 2015. 25-year-old Jack Taylor was a forklift driver. He was living with his parents at the time of his death. Jack had several girlfriends. Anne was not yet out of the closet. He used apps like Grindr to find dates with men. Jack was out at a gay club with friends until 10 p.m. on September 13, 2015. He was messaging back and forth with Stephen Port on Grindr. Stephen wanted to know if he ever took tea, or what we call crystal meth. Jack said that he had never taken it. They made plans and met up at the Barking Rail Station. Stephen walked Jack back to his flat, where he spiked Jack's drink with GHB. Once he was passed out, Stephen injected Jack with poppers, and he raped him. They found Jack's body posed in a seated position in St. Margaret's churchyard the next day. Police found a syringe in one pocket and a small container with two brown bottles in his other pocket. There was a white powder in his wallet and needle marks down his arm. Police treated this like another overdose, with no connection to all the other victims, found in the same churchyard, found in the same position. Police decided that further investigation was unnecessary. Jack was not a drug user, and his family did not accept law enforcement's characterization of his death. Jack's family did some research, and discovered the other three deaths in the area that happened prior to Jack. He had always been against drug use, and would never take drugs because of his job. There was no testing for DNA, and the syringe found on Jack was never used. Jack Taylor's family hired their own private investigator. Police admitted that they saw a man on CCTV walking with Jack prior to his death. They were reluctant to release the CCTV footage to the public. After Jack's family applied pressure to law enforcement, they released the video footage and it was actually a police officer who recognized that the mystery man in the video was Stephen Port. Police arrested Stephen at his flat on Cook Street in Barking. Law enforcement charged him with four counts of murder, six counts of administering a poison, seven counts of rape, and four counts of sexual assault. Prosecutors would later add eight more counts of administering a poison. They interviewed Port over the next several days, He denied knowing Gabrielle Cavari. He said that he might have met Daniel Whitworth at a party. Port denied knowing Jack Taylor, even though the CCTV evidence was clear, that the two men met at the Barking Station right before his death.
Port claimed to not know about the three churchyard deaths that took place so close to his home. It was lost on Stephen that all four men were found dead in the same sitting position, all with fatal levels of GHB in their system. Stephen Port showed the signs of someone who wasn't telling the truth. When people tell lies, they separate themselves from those lies by using a lower volume. Port spoke with a low voice level that would drop. People who are dishonest show signs of anxiety. Stephen closed his lips and crossed his arms. He wiggled around in his seat. Port repetitively clenched his fist and squeezed his hands. Liars will often use more negation. Port answered no to 40 of 47 questions they asked him. After his arrest, eight men came forward and said they were drugged, raped, and assaulted by Stephen Port at his apartment. Everyone had a similar account. Port spiked their drinks or injected them with a mystery substance from a small syringe. Some men went unconscious and woke up to Port raping them. Stephen Port, unlike many serial killers, had an unremarkable and average childhood it was only when he was in his 30s that he turned to drugs and began violating men. Stephen came from a working-class home with caring parents. He was a loner and didn't socialize with other kids. His sister Sharon was only two years older, and they were close. Stephen went to art school, but it was too expensive, so he became a chef. He came out as gay when he was in his 20s. Even as an adult, he was odd and childlike. Stephen enjoyed cartoons and would shop for children's toys for himself. He lived with his parents until he was 30. His parents did not like his gay lifestyle, but they tolerated it. His father, Albert, blamed his gayness on the fact that he was shy and introverted. He was convinced 
that someone took advantage of his son and turned him gay. Stephen finally moved into his own apartment and got edgier when he was outside the purview of his parents' scornful watch. He worked as an escort and pimped other men, too. Stephen's drug use began, and he took GHB regularly. He adopted different personas on social media and created fake profiles with his invented identities. He signed up on every LGBT site he could find. Grinder, Gator, Fit Lads, Slave Boys, Hornet, and Badoo. Some monikers he used were Shy Guy, Top Fun Joe, Basketball Guy. Stephen preferred slim, under 30-year-old men, commonly known as twinks in the gay community. Twinks are thin men in their teens or 20s and look younger than their age. In one profile, he claimed to be an Oxford graduate. In another, a special needs teacher or a seaman in the Royal Navy. Stephen's parents, Albert and Joan Port, confirmed that he did not study at Oxford University, nor was he ever in the military. The profile read, I am a shy, polite guy, enjoy keeping in shape, love to have a good time, I am romantic, caring, and would take good care of my partner. I am successful, educated, and determined. I'm looking for fun, or a date, or a boyfriend, between 18 and 24, slim, smooth, twink type, who has plenty of energy and enjoys a good time. This edgier lifestyle was not entirely revealed to his long-term boyfriends. Stephen was dating a 16-year-old boy. The relationship lasted two years. Stephen cheated on him and was even escorting behind the young man's back. His next boyfriend knew about the escorting that Port was still doing during their two-year relationship, and he allowed it. Port was bringing his clients back to his apartment and would arrange for group sex parties. Stephen had strict rules he followed when doing sex work. He would never accept a drink or anything to eat from a client. He always brought his own lube, condoms, and poppers. The Daily Mail discovered his escort reviews, which were positive, and they recommended him. Some descriptions of Stephen were shy, friendly, and loving. It was during this period that Port searched the depths of the internet for drug rape porn, and this kicked off a new chapter in his life. In 2012, Port met a teen on Grindr. When the boy arrived at Stephen's flat, he was offered a glass of red wine, but it tasted bitter. There was a weird sludge at the bottom of the glass, but it was too late, as the young man fell into a dreamy haze. Port told the kid to go lay down in the bedroom, which he did. After he fell asleep, he woke up for a moment, and Port was raping him. He closed his eyes again, and didn't stir until morning when he woke up disoriented. Port drove him to the train station and never said a word about the prior night. Stephen met another guy in Fit Lads, a UK and Ireland gay social network. This young 20-something Muslim man had never taken drugs or had a sip of alcohol in his entire life. They hung out four times, and everything was cordial, but on the fifth time, Port gave him poppers, and the man fell asleep. When he woke up, Port gave him a clear liquid, which he said was water. The man drank it and went out again. He woke up on the floor without his underwear. The man was disoriented and screamed. Port clothed and took the man back to the barking station. The man made a scene so the police got involved, and they called an ambulance. Stephen told the police that this man had arrived at his apartment in the state, and he was just trying to get him home. The man was Muslim, and therefore was not out to his parents, so he decided not to tell anyone about what happened to him. He picked up the phone later, and called Port to confront him. He provided no satisfactory answers. Right after this incident, is when Stephen Port met Anthony Walgate. During the same month, Stephen experienced a small amount of fame. He appeared on BBC's Celebrity Master Chef, wearing his blonde toupee. He had a small role on the show, and he helped J.B. Gill, a famous singer, prepare and serve meals for bus drivers. Just over one year from his appearance on Master Chef, he would become infamous for murder and rape. After his arrest, they placed him into Level A, Her Majesty Prison, Belmarsh, which is the highest level of security based on the extent and seriousness of his crimes. 
Stephen found himself inside his cell 23 hours a day. He was not allowed to have visitors and can only communicate to the outside world via letter. After the media widely publicized his case, he received romantic letters from both men and women. When Stephen Port went to trial, there was an insurmountable amount of direct and circumstantial evidence against him. They found all four victims close to Port's apartment. Each victim's cell phone was missing, and most likely taken by Port to hide the digital evidence that he had messaged with all the victims. All the murdered men were found with high levels of GHB. All the men were placed in the same sitting position, with their shirts pulled up as if someone dragged them to that spot. DNA from the blue bed sheet found with Daniel Whitworth matched Port. Stephen created the fake John Luck profile in Facebook and had followed Gabrielle Kavari so he could keep tabs on the investigation. Police confirmed that this profile came from Port's IP address. Stephen's Google search history showed that drugging and raping young gay unconscious men turned him on. His phone had 83 videos that showed him having sex with unconscious men. During the trial, Port told substantial lies. He denied writing the suicide note until the handwriting expert verified that the writing was Stevens. Port changed the story to say that he wrote the suicide note, but Whitworth did the dictation. During the interrogation, Port denied knowing Jack Taylor. At trial, they played the CCTV footage showing him and Jack Taylor together. Port changed the story and said that Jack took a bunch of drugs and wanted a two-hour sex session in the churchyard. Digital forensics revealed that the morning after he met Jack, Port blocked him on Grindr, which deleted the text exchanges between them. Jack was likely already dead, and Stephen later deleted his Grindr account to further hide evidence. Several victims testified at trial. One 22-year-old man was at Stephen's flat, and his drink was spiked. He went unconscious. Stephen penetrated him, filmed it, and showed the man the video the next day. An older, 35-year-old victim met Port on Grinder in July 2015. By this time, Stephen had advanced to taking drugs anally because it allowed for quicker absorption. The pair agreed to have sex, but the man was against taking drugs. Port pretended to put lube on the man with a syringe-type device. The victim's backside immediately burned, tingled, and went numb. He realized that Port most likely had drugged him. He was able to get dressed and leave before the drugs took over. Another victim had a similar story. He met Port on Grindr. Unfortunately, he lost consciousness as Port raped him. In September 2015, a different victim hooked up with Port via Grindr. Stephen covertly administered drugs anally to this man, who made it clear in their exchanges on Grinder that he didn't take drugs. This man felt intense pain and became dizzy. Luckily, he got up and left before the drugs rendered him senseless. A 24-year-old victim had a prior sexual relationship with Port. That man became homeless when he fell on hard times. In October 2015, he stayed at Port's flat. They both did drugs at Stephen's request and had sex. The victim wasn't entirely into this, but it was technically consensual because he felt like it was easier to give in than to argue about it. But when they had sex again, Port pulled his pretending to apply lube act, and the victim lost consciousness as Stephen Port raped him. Port was convicted on November 23, 2016. They found him guilty on all counts of murder, rape, sexual assault, and administering a substance with intent. They read impact statements. Anthony Walgate's mom described him as clever, funny, and talented. She said not only did Port destroy their family, he destroyed his own. Gabrielle Cavari's brother could not put the loss into words and said it forever changed their family. Daniel Whitworth's father says he lives with daily grief and his friends say the light has left his eyes. Jack Taylor's family said it was devastating to have to go through having his body exhumed for forensic testing, and the loss is a black hole that will never be filled. Port received a life sentence and has yet to apologize or show any remorse, 
His parents believe he is innocent. In fall 2018, Stephen appealed his conviction for the murders. He thought that they should have convicted him on manslaughter instead. Stephen said that the men took GHB and had other alcohol and drugs in their system before they interacted with him. A judge quickly dismissed the appeal. Even with Port behind bars, the families of the deceased men demanded answers. 17 officers are being investigated by the Independent Police Complaints Commission for mishandling this case. The commission will examine if discrimination played a part in the police making terrible decisions. Police are also taking another look at 58 GHB-related deaths of gay men during the time frame when Stephen Port was active. There is a civil case against the Metropolitan Police. Jack Taylor would probably still be alive if they would have done an actual investigation into the prior murders. The Metro Police now give their officers a checklist and how to respond to and investigate chemsex incidents. Anthony Walgate's aunt wants people to take care when using dating apps and websites. It dramatically changed their lives when they lost Anthony. She wants parents to reinforce stranger danger warnings with their kids and realize that predators use the internet. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources and music used in this episode. There are many ways to support the show, which are listed on the website, and I just started a Patreon for people who are interested in that. Eventually, I'll add additional rewards and tiers when I have more bandwidth to deal with it. But for now, the best way to support the show is just tell a friend. The featured podcast for this week is the Mysterious Midwest podcast. I'll let Sarah and Danielle tell you all about it. Hey, 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 this is Danielle. And this is Sarah. And we're the Mysterious Midwest podcast. That's us. We're here. (laughs) We'll be dropping episodes weekly about the ookiest and spookiest happenings in the Midwest. From cryptids to hauntings and creatures that go bump in the night. Be sure to join us for a laugh, because we do a lot of that. Y'all. And a drink (laughs) while we talk about this strange and unusual. You can find us at MysteriousMidwestPod.com, and we're downloadable on wherever you listen to your podcasts. And we are all about that social media, so feel free to find us. Find us. On Facebook at Mysterious Midwest Podcast. Yep, we're there. Instagram at Mysterious Midwest. Yep, lots of selfies. And don't forget about Twitter at Mysterious. Midwest. Yes, please. Find us on all the things. You won't regret it even a little bit. Not at (laughs) all. Hey, guys, say, on your way home tonight, watch Watch for for deer. deer. Okay, bye.